Dexter, Miami's friendly neighborhood serial killer, the dark defender, the killer of the killers. Every season, Dexter would have another serial killer to face off against. But which one was the best? Which one was the scariest? And which one was the worst? In this video, I'm going to rank my top 10 big bad serial killers for Dexter. Heavy, heavy spoilers for the whole show. Uh, worst to best, let's go. Number 10, Hannah McKay, the Poisoner. Ugh, I hate this character. Hannah McKay is probably my least favorite character in the entire series. As soon as she's introduced and her and Dexter start giving their little sexy glances to each other, I'm just like, oh no, I see what they're doing here and I am not okay with it. Ooh, what if Dexter fell in love with a super sexy serial killer? Fuck that and no. His one and only true love was Rita, and that tragically ended. Rita and Dexter's relationship was a facade at first, like a cover, and it morphed into something different that you might be able to call love. But that took four seasons, four complicated, interesting, challenging seasons, and this quick, fast, brash love conquers all teenage romance for the ages. Just no. He's got her on his kill table, he's like, I'm gonna kill her. Actually, I'm gonna fuck her. Oh yeah! Oh no. Oh no. And it's not so much that he's had sex with her, he's had sex with lots of other characters in the show. But the fact that it's this brash, love conquers all, teenage romance for the ages, it just doesn't work for Dexter at all. She completely slows down season 7's momentum with Dexter and Deb, and all that's happening with them, it's getting so exciting and amazing, and she's just there bogging it down, making it not one of the best seasons which it should be. I understand they wanted to have Dexter give up his dark passenger for love, but I mean, you shouldn't do that. But if you're going to do that, maybe cast someone with a single speck of chemistry with Michael C. Hall. Dexter twice narrates while they're both naked about how much chemistry they have. I think it's some giant meta joke just looking directly at me, Jax, the infuriated audience member because they have no chemistry you must be aware of that Michael C Hall you're bringing your all you're always bringing your all you're always doing amazing stuff but she is just atrocious the character is bad the acting's bad the writing's bad the writers have no idea what they want to do with her it feels really muddled at first she's like a villain femme fatale and then she's Dexter's one and true love that runs away with Harrison like, she's the one that runs away with Harrison? What are you talking about? What's so annoying is that at the end of season seven, it kind of almost works, where Dexter actually turns on her and has her arrested. And you're like, okay, I don't love her as a character, but that almost kind of works. And then she comes back in season eight. Despite season eight's atrocious Harry ghost retconning and not being a hunt for the Bay Hub of Witcher part two season and just all the other issues, it's actually not that bad, isn't it? But then Hannah gets introduced and the show takes a very fast, just dive off a cliff, just absolutely dives off a cliff, or, you know, jumps the shark. Or as I like to call it now when a show gets really, really shit, sails into the hurricane. It infuriates me to my core that Harrison is left. Dexter's son, Harrison is left with Hannah, this completely unsuitable serial killer monster that I never liked, and she's just off running about in Argentina, and Dexter's like, that's good, I'm happy leaving Harrison. I don't want him to be with me, the serial killer, that has a code and, you know, isn't the worst person ever, but I'll leave, I'll leave him with Hannah. Hannah McKay. Her line about them talking about blood and death, like they're flirting about past sexual experiences. <laughs> One redeeming aspect is that Deb hates her, and I love Deb, so I feel like we're bonding together over hating Hannah. But then Deb forgives her? They are eating? She's eating food Hannah has made in season 8? What?! Her best scene in the entire series is in the finale of the show. Probably my favourite part of that atrocious finale, where Harrison and her are on the bus, leaving, and Hannah starts talking to Harrison, and then the kid actor just does some of the best acting you've ever seen, and he just falls asleep. As she's talking, she bores him to sleep. Cinema gold, guys. That's cinema gold. Number nine, the brain surgeon. Somehow, this guy is the final big bad that Dexter faces. He is probably the most underwhelming, boring, uncharismatic villain we've come up against in the entire show. It disgusts and infuriates me to my core that this was the final guy that Dexter faced. He lasts till the finale, which is just insane and completely disappointing. If only, if only. Only we lived in a world where Vogel's son was never revealed to be the brain surgeon. And that guy Dexter just killed halfway through the season. That was the brain surgeon. And then we could have focused on season 8's back half of the season, which could have been the hunt for the Bay Harbor Butcher part 2, which it should have been. And we wouldn't have to be dealing with this boring, terribly written, and just completely nothing character, the brain surgeon. I blame the brain surgeon for rearing his boring uncharismatic head in the back half of the season and dispatching what could have been a really great arc with Zack. He just kills him off, off screen for one, but that could have been a really great character and it was starting to have this 
amazing prodigy of Dexter kind of arc that was happening. And then it's just like, no, nah, the brain surgeon's back, baby. He's back. Aren't you excited for that? Not at all. What the hell? And the worst part of his character, he fucking kills Dev. Are you kidding me? Dev, the greatest character ever, is dispatched by the brain surgeon. And it's not even like this big, epic, ritual kill or something tragic like Rita's death. He shoots her and then she has complications and is brain dead? I know what you're going to say. Technically Dexter killed her and you know, he takes the plug out of her. He's the one that does it. But I disagree. It's the brain surgeon that shoots her. She's brain dead. She's not coming back from that. And the fact they want to have their cake and eat it too, where they don't want to have Dexter and Deb finally, after all these years, come to a head and one of them has to kill the other one. And it's so annoying because technically Dexter kills her and technically the last victim that he throws off of his boat is Deb. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have them both love each other. And she's like, I forgive you, Dexter. I forgive you. And then he's like, yeah, I, I'm the best. I'm, I'm no punishment for Dexter, boy. And then he still kills her, but he doesn't really kill her. It's the brain surgeon. And so just the brain surgeon being involved in this just makes me so angry. He's such a nothing character. The way he's killed by Dexter is just like, that's clearly murder. What's going on here? You guys, and they're all just like, we're okay with this. But it's not like, oh my God, we know there's a Bay Hubbard Butcher and we're okay with this, which would have been at least something. That would have made the brain surgeon kind of awesome bringing that out. But no, he just dies, obviously murdered by another psychopath. He just dies. Everything about the brain surgeon is terrible. Apart from the fact that him killing Dev is just awful and annoying, it's so annoying as well now that we're actually getting this Dexter new blood, like this new season, is if Dexter gets found out to be the Bay Harbor Butcher, we can't have Deb being alive, kind of having to deal with the fact that she sided with Dexter. So I feel like the brain surgeon ruined that potential storyline for New Blood as well. Not to mention he's the son of Mrs. Retcon herself, ruining Dexter's father, Harry's entire arc and, you know, just character. Just Character Assassination 101, retconning his entire existence. Harry's code is so fundamental to the show. Harry's ghost, everything about it. Oh, actually, no, it was never Harry. It was, uh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't call it Harry's code. You should call it random old lady's code. Vogel's code. Oh, oh just saying that. Oh, just saying that hurts. Number eight, The Skinner. Now I have to be honest, guys. Before I rewatched all of Dexter and Hype for New Blood, I did a cheeky little list of all the, you know, serial killers, and I was ranking them just because I was like, oh, will it change, you know, after a rewatch for, after so many years? And I forgot the Skinner. I just forgot he existed. I made a list, everyone was on it, every single character was on it. But the Skinner. He is very gross and visceral and horrible, but as a character, completely unmemorable. He doesn't really get any screen time to work with, so he doesn't really get much to do. At points, he's like, I'm chilling and silent and scary, but yeah, it's a bit like, meh. Season three really feels like the Miguel Prado season, and the Skinner just kind of feels like a side dish to Miguel's main course. But it's not like a side dish where you're like, oh man, that's so delicious and tasty. We could just order three or four more. We don't even need to have a main tonight. More like, you know, when you're driving home and you're like, oh, I guess that side dish complemented the main dish. Probably could have just not filled up on it though. Could have just, you know, waited for the main. Maybe that would have been a better go. Number seven, Doomsday. Season six, the season where it gets all religious out of nowhere. A lot of people don't really like this villain, but I really, really like him for the most part. I love the insane, wild, crazy ritual kills that we get this season. There's snakes that are intestines and bloody Frankenstein horse mannequins riding down the street. It's crazy stuff. We've got the angel of death and all this kind of insane, wild stuff to look at. And for a show that is uh, essentially a serial killer killing other serial killers, and each year we get another serial killer for him to face off against, and you get into season six, it's starting to get a little repetitive. I think that the wild, crazy, heightened, over-the-top, ritualistic kills of this season are kind of add an extra layer and kind of take it beyond being just another year, another serial killer. And I think that really helps. And I really like that aspect of it. Colin Hanks himself as a character is a little bit one note and not the greatest villain, but what he brings out of the rest of the cast when the whole season kind of has this religious focus is really interesting. There's a really good counterbalance to the Doomsday character with the Moss Death character. And it's just really interesting seeing all these themes play out, but that's not really, you know, mostly to do with the character, just with the religious themes that the character brings while being like this religious serial killer nut job. At first, the Doomsday Killer is kind of, you know, it's not that interesting, it kind of just plods along. It's a little one note, but I really, really like the reveal that he's got his own Harry's ghost that's kind of talking to him, someone that he's murdered, and it's this kind of twisted play on the Harry's ghost that Dexter has. Because I feel like this late in the game, sometimes it's hard to remember that uh, the Harry's ghost is kind of really dark and demented and scary. It's really just a story device at this point, and you kind of forget that it's this really intense, dark look at the psyche of this person. Like, Harry killed himself when he realized what Dexter was, and now Dexter just like, 
has that dad just like talk to him being like, yeah, we can get away with this murder. Let's do some more murders. It's kind of like screwed up and intense. And I like how we kind of have that reinforced and brought back to reality with Colin Hanks character and his Harry's ghost. And I don't know, I really like that parallel between the two. The twist might be a little obvious, I haven't talked to anyone, but I was so young when I first watched it, it blew my mind. It just, I was like, ah! I could go on and on about faith and themes and all the things, but I think what really, really sums it up is the character of Moss Def says, if you put your faith in the wrong thing, it can really fuck you up. And I think that completely summarizes everything that works about this season and all the really interesting and complex ideas and thoughts that this season brings to the table. Doomsday gets the bonus of being the kill on Dexter's table when Deb finds out, so it's always more memorable to me. And I really like the idea that like, Doomsday was like, the world's coming to an end, the world's gonna end. And when he dies, Dex's world kind of ends and crumbles and you know, it's changed forever. And not just that, but the show has kind of changed and gone to a point where it was never getting to. Like season five kind of fake teased, like a bit of a cock tease that Deb was gonna find out. And it was kind of like, oh, we're just gonna, is that not gonna happen? Is that just like a little tease? And now Deb has found out and Dexter's world has ended and the show will never be the same again. So I really like that kind of symbolic uh, metaphoryness. Doomsday is really fascinating kind of on an idea level, but as the character himself, it's a little one note. He doesn't really carry the menace that a lot of the other serial killers do. I don't really buy him a lot of the time. It's just kind of like, uh, if you really know you're not the best character when the best episode of your season is the one where you're barely in it and it's Dexter and the ice truck killer who's being the Harry's ghost for this episode and they're going on a road trip to stop the Trinity son from going all Trinity on his family. So it's all these elements from all the other seasons in this one episode road trip episode and you're not really in it. So it's like, oh. Last point about DDK, it brought us the amazing Dexter head devil religious drawing which is just incredible. It's my favorite thing I've ever seen in my entire life, the biblical artistry of it all, but the absolute preposterous insanity and hilarity that is just a giant Dexter's face and he's all like, ah, it's just, it's just, it's incredible. It could be the funniest moment of the entire series. It's absolutely preposterous. I have no idea what they were going for emotionally from the audience, but it can't have been just hysterical laughter and just like, infathomable joy. Like I just, I love it. I love it to my core so much. The moment where he rage draws it and then we finally see it is just incredible. And we are blessed with the image so many times. I absolutely love it. God bless the writers and the artists who brought us this amazing like combination of biblical artistry and Dexter's face. Number six, Jordan Chase and the Barrel Boy. The first season with a gang of killers, not just one. And I really, really like that idea. And then we have Dexter and Lumen teaming up with this kind of rape revenge horror film angle to the whole season. And I think all of that is really awesome. But I don't think that the idea of a gang of killers is kind of utilized and brought to fruition in the way that it could have been. Because at the end, it kind of just becomes very weakly segmented killing one serial killer, then the next, then the next, then the next. You know, we go, boy, down the dentist, and then bam, 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 bam. And it's just like, oh, okay. We didn't really get any moment where all the killers were working together as one team, as a gang of killers. So that's kind of a bit of a letdown. And it's all, you know, brought together as one big story, one big arc, but it really is just kind of serial killers of the week. And it never really gets that moment to kind of shine and the concept to really shine through of like a team, like, you know, a a villain force that they're dealing with. Enter main man for the season, Mr. Tick Tick Tick, Mr. Self-Help Guru, Mr. Take It, Mr. Jordan Chase. And this performance is amazing. He's charismatic, he's charming. He's only in the back half of the season, but it feels like he's in more of it. He's a really, really good character, and he is this motivational speaker. I love that he's famous, and there's a crowd of people, and they're all cheering, and they're like, I love you, Jordan Chase, and he's like, take it, and you're like, oh. It's good that he's helping those people, you know, take what they want, you know, get 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 out of that shyness of their bodies, you know, really take what they want. And then, oh no, he takes, he takes murder. He's a bad man, oh no. And I really like how that all switches, you know, there's like this underlining perverse uh, level to what he's saying once you realize who he is. And I don't know, it takes this really twisted form when you see the motivational speaking and then when you find out that his motivational speaking, he's kind of got, he's got his little motivational speaky hands into all his friends and all his friends are like rapists and murderers and all this disgusting stuff. But he doesn't really do that. He just, you know, stands behind speaking to them, kind of twisting them with words and he never gets his hands dirty. And that's really compelling and terrifying. And it's an awful different new type of villain that we haven't seen before. But then when push comes to shove right at the end of the season, which is just him, 
he does get his hands dirty. And that's probably my biggest complaint for the whole season, is that I think it would have been a really interesting character choice if when push comes to shoves and he's fighting Dexter and he's oh, got that lady there and all this stuff, he can't get his hands dirty. He can't punch. He can't kill. He can't do anything. He can only just make others. And that's kind of how he got his perverse desires and Dark Passenger out, is making others do the deed. But when it came to it, he couldn't do the deed. But at the end, he's just punching and stuff and he can. And it's like, ah. Oh. I feel like you haven't followed through with the character properly. And I just think that doesn't work. So I think that's kind of the big change I would make. This season is easily the hardest for me to watch. The whole gang mentality of this group, even though we don't see them in full force, there are videos from the past when they've got all the women tied up and stuff. Just the rape, murder aspect of it. There's something a bit more grimy and disgusting about this season. And I mean, all of the, all these people on this list are horrible serial killer monsters, but these guys kind of just feel a bit more real. They feel less like kind of a, uh, versions of Dexter without the code, and just disgusting and horrible men. There's like a gang bro mentality to it that's really off-putting, and it's just really hard to re-watch. The horrible depravity of these villains really does bring back the idea that Dexter is kind of right in a lot of ways, and that Harry's code really does help the world, and it's helping Lumen, and all this stuff is really fascinating for the audience, really reinforces how Dexter is here on this world, the dark defender, the dark vigilante. He really is just Batman with a bloodier code and a bloodier origin story. Holy donuts, Dexter, we're halfway. What better way to celebrate being halfway through the list than doing a cheeky couple of honorable mentions? These aren't serial killers of the year per se, but just serial killer characters that I thought really, really worked in the show. Lila, scary, awful, terrifying, an amazing character and an amazing performance. Her fire and mass manipulation and all the evil deeds she did. She tried to kill Angel, Angel for God's sake, and Rita's kids. Oh. And her killing dogs is still one of the most tragic, heartbreaking moments of the entire series. On the plus side, when Dexter had to kill her, he had to go all the way to Paris. So he got to go to Paris. Cool stuff. Zack, an amazing, interesting character. I really, really like him. He's like a prodigy to Dexter. Dexter's now becoming the Harry, teaching the Harry's code to Zack. And that's really fascinating, especially when Zack's like, maybe he's a bit too old. Maybe the code's not going to work. Maybe it's not going to... And all these really, really interesting things. And then... The brain surgeon's like, actually, this season's about me, so I killed Zack off screen. So I've wasted the potential of the character. I've wasted this amazing concept. I've wasted the fact that maybe he could lead to Dexter being found out as the Bay Harbor Butcher and Bay Harbor Butcher Part 2, the hunt for all these things are gonna happen. No, this season is about me, the most charismatic character of all, the brain surgeon. Come on, dear brain surgeon! Lumen. An amazing, tragic character, ripped straight out of a rape revenge horror film. She compliments Dexter perfectly. She needs to use him. He needs to use her. They learn and grow. She kind of works as this weird rebound girl for Dexter in his own kind of weird Dexter way. And I really, really like that. And she doesn't overstay her welcome. Looking at you, Hannah. Professor Vogel, Mrs. Retcon herself, Mrs. Ruining Harry and Harry's code and his entire character and legacy. But if you take all of that away and you get rid of the retconning and all that stuff, I think the idea of this psychiatrist who's so fascinated with serials and all that stuff that she wants to help them grow and she wants to learn from them and all this stuff is really, really fascinating. Her entire arc outside of the retconning of Harry's code, I think is fantastic. I just can't get past the retconning, so it's a fantastic character idea in theory, but in practice, she starts off being like, boo, it's me, Mrs. Retcon, Mrs. Harry's code. Actually, it's called Vogel's code. Oh boy, just saying that makes me want to... Minotaur Man. This character is crazy. The ritual kill where he dresses up with a minotaur horns and he chases people through the minotaur maze is terrifying and incredible. When Dexter gets in the maze, it's just absolutely terrifying stuff. And I think this character kind of works because it's a scary, awful villain and a serial killer of the week to deal with. Always in a few episodes, but you know what I mean. And it works on that level, but he also works because of where he's posed in the story. Deb has found out about Dexter, and we're at this incredibly interesting and terrifying point with their relationship, where she's like, oh, I know he's a serial killer, I know he kills bad people, but ooh. And then enter Minotaur Man. He's a monster, and he's the worst of the worst, and he slips through the cracks. So he's used to reinforce why Dexter and his code are necessary in this awful kind of way, and it helps Deb realize that. And that's really, really fascinating. So I think the character works from being terrifying and scary and all Minotaur Man, he's like, ah! But it's also a really interesting character in the position of season seven. And I think that's why he's probably the standout to me uh, for both reasons as the serial kill of the week. Or is it a couple of weeks? But you know what I mean.
And it reinforces why Dexter works when it's really working. Because Dexter is a monster, a psychopath, a serial killer. But he's cleaning up the streets of utter filth that are just so much worse than him. Like Minotaur Man. Dexter really just is Batman with a bloodier code and a bloodier origin story. Oh my... Oh my god, I just realised how amazing it would be to have a Dexter vs Batman comic book. Somebody make this right now, please! Number 5. Miguel Prado. Jimmy Smits. Matt Santos himself. Bail Organa himself. To me, Jimmy Smits is always playing these upstanding political figures that are always there to do good. And Miguel Prado starts off like this, and then he takes a terrifying turn into Dexter's dark passenger world. The performance from Jimmy Smith is just spectacular. He's towering, commanding, terrifying. We go from this really, really interesting character that is at first antagonistic to Dexter, and then they slowly have this budding friendship, which is so good, and so good for Dexter at this point, because Dexter's like, oh, can I have a friend? We can go play golf, but we can also wrap people up in plastic wrap and stab them together. But then the code becomes too much for Miguel, and this happens again and again throughout the series. We see these serial killers who are so similar to Dexter, think they understand him, think they know him, but this code, Harry's code, that makes him the hero we all love, uh, he just... They can't get past it, and that's really, really fascinating, and it really works with Miguel. There are some moments where he starts to be okay with Dexter, and Dexter's okay with him. But then, he kills that slimy, dirty lawyer. But being like a better call soul, Saul Goodman, slimy lawyer, does not mean you deserve to be on Dexter's kill table. So Dexter's coming for you, Miguel. Dexter's showing Miguel how to hunt and vet the victims, and then capturing them and having revealing his kill room, plastic wrap and all, is so exciting, and it's so cool for the character of Dexter to be like, I can have a friend! And then Miguel's like, I'm gonna take it too far, and he's like, oh man, I can't have a friend! And it ends with such a heartbreaking moment where he's got him on that kill table, and he's like, what'd you say at my wedding? Friends forgive. Well, I don't forgive, and I don't get to have friends. Oh, my little heart! Oh. The final moments where he has him on the kill table are just so heartbreaking, where he's like, it was me all along, me all along, I killed your little brother, and he's like, trying to break through, he's like, I'm oh, kill you, Dexter! Incredible. Just, that he's like, such a happy, chill, like, family man. I'm out for justice, I'm the DA attorney, I'm, I'm, you know, he's a upstanding citizen. And then, actually, we find out, as we peel the layers away from this character, he's angry, he's tormented, he's violent, he's impulsive. And it's just so scary, like, when he's doing that, you think he's gonna break through the plastic and just kill Dexter, like, he's such a scary, scary character. Jimmy Smith is just such a powerhouse in this season. And really, I'm gonna say that for most of the characters coming up in the rest of the list, Dexter had such a good ability to cast, just cast exceptionally. And Jimmy Smith is one of the highlights. He is so good. It's so... Just... Number four, Isaac the Mobster. Isaac is such an interesting character for Dexter to face so late in the game. For so many seasons, Dexter's gone up against people that are like him. They've got a code, a ritual. They can have a flashy title like Ice Truck Killer Doomsday. Whereas Isaac, he's grabbed straight out of the Sopranos of Boardwalk Empire. He's just a mobster and he does it for work, for money. It's a totally different type of killer. And I find that really, really fascinating so late in the game. At first, he feels like just a run-of-the-mill mobster, you know? Oh, we, you killed one of our guys? Oh, we're gonna kill you now! And all that kind of stuff. But then it slowly develops and we learn so much more about Isaac. But I think he has like a passion and a love to him that none of the other killers can have because they are so much more like psychopaths, like Dexter. Whereas Isaac's just a man. His business is dirty and awful. And he is a murderer, but he's a very different type of murderer that we've ever seen before. And I find that really, really compelling. His performance is fantastic. Chilling at times. And a little bit funny at times as well. A little dry. But uh, there's got like this emotional weight and heart to it that a lot of the other serial killers don't have. Only shame of the character really is that he's dispatched before the end of the season, so we have to focus on Hannah Bloody McKay. Ugh. Isaac and Dexter get numerous scenes where they're just sitting and chatting and they have this serial killer versus serial killer kind of like, you know, standoff, but it's like usually out in the open where they can't really be too open about it, so there's a lot of subtle, dry, comedic kind of digs, and the dialogue is just on fire with these two. The performance is absolutely killing it. Both men are just on fire. It's it's some of the best stuff in the whole show. I really love their dynamic. And the moment where I completely fall in love with Isaac, and I think the whole season completely works with the character, is when we have the moment at the gay bar, where Dexter and Isaac sit down, 
and they have this incredibly well-written scene where Isaac just kind of goes through how illogical and dangerous love is and how he's not going to back down, even though he's not going to bring back Victor. It's the moment where we find out that he was in love with Victor. It's just a brilliant moment as both these men have lost the love of their lives and they both sit there and they can't come past this moment. Isaac's going to come and kill Dexter. Dexter's going to defend himself. And even though I don't like Hannah, it comes at a perfect moment for Dexter to be hearing all this stuff about a logical love and it being worth it and all this kind of stuff. It's just beautifully written. And then they bloody team up. Nothing better than serial killers punching for a bit. And then they're mates. And then they punch for a bit again. Oh, it's just... I love it. Number three is... The Ice Truck Killer. OG Season 1 Serial Killer of the Year. Dexter's brother. Also born in blood, but without the code. The Ice Truck Killer is such an amazing character, but he does remind me a little bit of like a, a superhero's uh, arch nemesis. That was like, I'm the same as you and me, we're, we're not so different to you and I, and I've got, I've got the same powers as you, but look at my costume, it's black, not yellow, or whatever. What sets this apart from being a very bulk standard version of that kind of archetype for a hero villain kind of situation though, I think is just the execution, performance, and the way that it's presented. But first, it's just this cat and mouse game from this mysterious ice truck killer. It's such an interesting thing with the ice truck killer slowly trying to lure Dexter out, kind of show him he knows who he is and all this stuff and trying to tempt him to kill and do all these things. It's such a great foil for Dexter, the man who loves blood. He bloody can't get enough of blood. Nothing better than a crime scene full of blood. But now there's this killer leaving bodies with no blood and all these secret messages to Dexter. And this amazing cat and mouse game throughout the season that then leads to the big hotel room just filled with blood, the most horrific thing you've ever seen. And then we get the revelation of the shipping container. And then the revelation that he wasn't alone in the shipping container and that his brother was in there, but just a couple of years too old. So it kind of already seeped into him. So everyone kind of sensed that it's heartbreaking and tragic. Like, I, he's, an Astro Killer is a monster, but it's such a heartbreaking idea that he's gone his whole life having these awful dark passenger tendencies. No one knows no Harry to guide him or anything like that. And then he finds out he has a brother. He tracks down his brother, who also is a serial killer, but a serial killer with a code. And he doesn't really realize how strong that code is you're built into Dexter's like being. And he does the terrible and awful thing of bringing Deb into it. So when they have their final confrontation, he thinks it's gonna go a certain way. But he's brought Deb into it. He's going to force Dexter to kill Deb, which he's not going to do. And so it's this really tragic moment where you're like, oh, this character's a monster and evil. But it's almost heartbreaking that Dexter just isn't the brother he thought he was going to be. And considering Dexter's a serial killer, you know, I can understand why he would think he'd be like that. And they were never going to be together. That code was so strong. But it's such an interesting and terrifying kind of dynamic. And it kind of all comes to a head when the ice truck killer is like, you can't be a killer and a hero. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> oh, buddy. That's literally the premise of this show. So you die. A great villain isn't just a great villain on their own, but they should help us learn something about our hero. And they should force that hero to adapt and change. And the Ice Truck Killer does that perfectly. We learn so much about Dexter and his past, but it also forces us to realize how strong the code is with Dexter and how he is the hero in this story. Seeing Brian again in the season six episode where they go on a road trip, really I feel like reinforced to me how great the character works and how it's almost a little bit of a shame that we don't get more of him. Because most of his performance is posing as Deb's like, lovable, uh, you know, lovable boyfriend. But, you know, on a rewatch, that really is disgusting and tragic and just horrifically horrible. Like, the moment we realize he's the one putting back the body parts, like the amputee body parts on this victim, and he was the one who cut those body parts off, like, that's so disgusting and disturbing. Like, on the rewatch, it, I, I almost couldn't handle it. It was so sickening and disgusting. Like, he's such a, oh, he's a piece of work. On the first watch, when he kidnaps Deb, it is so terrifying. Like, absolutely, you cannot kill Deb. Please do not kill Deb. She's such a great character. But on a rewatch, it's just heartbreaking and tragic. Like, there's a line where he was like, it was so easy to make you fall in love with me. She was so desperate to fall in love. And it's just, oh, it's just sick and heartbreaking. Just, oh, Deb, my heart. The visual elements of the ritual kills of the ice truck killer with the, the frozen bodies, but just like the thing, the painted fingernails and leaving the little, the little doll with the painted fingernails in Dexter's apartment and all that stuff is just so brilliant and so amazing. It's sort of like uh, captivating in a morbidly fascinating way. And I, and it's, it really kind of helps you get into Dexter's mindset, the way he's so fascinated by it and we're so caught up in the mystery of it all. And it's just an absolutely compelling first season villain and yeah, one of the best. Number two is... The Trinity Killer. 
<laughs> what do I even say about this madman? Mr. Third Rock from the Sun, Mr. Alien from Another World. John Lithgow is just so good. He is so terrifying in this role. I can never watch him in anything else for the rest of my life and not just be like, that's Trinity, the worst man who ever lived. Trinity comes at a point in Dexter's life where he's like, I've got a family. I've got a little kid of my own. I'm living the suburban dream. But how do I, you know, how do I balance my dark passenger and that suburban family man lifestyle? Enter Trinity and he has it all. Has the family, the suburban life. He's still serial killing. 30 years, 40 years in, he's the most prolific one they've ever met. And it's such a great idea for Dexter to be so fascinated by that, that he wants to learn from him. And so he sneaks his way into his life to learn from him. And then that horrific turn, because it's like, if, if Trinity can do it, I can do it. I can, I can make this family life work and be a monster serial killer, dark passenger boy. But then that turn, when he starts to realize that Trinity doesn't have it all together, and that his family loathe him, they despise him. That terrifying Thanksgiving episode where you just realize how completely, completely fucked his family is and how much they loathe him and just how much horror he's causing them is heartbreaking because Dex is like, wait, 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 wait. Can, can I not have both worlds either? Can I not balance this? And then the absolute, complete and utter tragedy of it all is that he's kept him alive for so long that, that it gets to a point where Trinity is then able to murder Rita and he can still, he still kills Trinity, but it's too late. And, tr and just that balancing act has actually ironically ruined his chance of a family and he can't have a family. Rita's dead. It's, it's just one of the most terrifying and heartbreaking moments of cinema history. It's just, it's such a great end to the arc of like, can I balance them? Can I have family? Can I have the serial killer? And you can't. No, you can't. Because serial killer is going to kill you. Your life is too tumultuous and evil and violent and dark and terrifying. It's not going to work. But the way it happens, like the idea of like him killing Trinity on that first watch, it never would have occurred to me in my wildest dreams that something could be wrong with Rita. Because Trinity's dead. Like what other show, what other thing ever has the villain been killed and then it's revealed they've actually murdered the most important character in the show. Like it's... It's unheard of. It's the Red Wedding before we knew what the Red Wedding was. It's just so disgusting and despite, oh, just, and so because of that, the Trinity is one of the most re well-remembered characters for everybody. And it's one of the most terrifying villains, but not just because of the Rita death, like the performance throughout the entire season. There are moments where he's just like in a bath, just screaming and crying. And it's just, Oh, it's a lot to deal with. There are so many moments this season that are just so terrifying. He's so big. He's so scary. The moments with his family at the Thanksgiving dinner are particularly terrifying. Their road trip episode with him and Dexter as he starts to kind of unravel a little bit and we learn about the origin of why he's doing this Trinity killings is particularly disturbing as well. And then, to cap it all off, he's not even a Trinity killer. He's a bloody four Quinity killer. You know what I mean? He kills four times, not three. I'm not a scientist. I don't know the wording. But he is just so scary with that kid. Just down in that basin with the train tracks, with the train. Oh, my Lord. And just him being like, I'm going to call you Arthur. Do you want to eat this burger? It's just like, oh, no. John Lithgow, get fucked, mate. Oh, God. It's so scary. It's so terrifying. Everything about this character works. Once again, like the Ice Truck Killer, everything about him is amazing and terrifying and horrific. The rituals, this, that, that, the performance, it's all working as a character, but it also complements Dexter so well, and it comes at the perfect point for Dexter as a character to learn about himself, to try and become a family man, then he realizes he can't have a family. And he can't. And it almost takes all of season five for him to just deal with it. One of the best episodes of the entire series is just that first episode of season five, with it's just like a morning of Rita, like a post-Rita what Trinity's done to my life, like, episode. And it's spectacular and heartbreaking and tragic. And, yeah, Trinity just chopped. Oh, but not mwah in, like, the good way. Mwah in, like, the, fuck you, you're a monster, and it's, you just, oh. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, so that's more like, it's more like Trinity. Ugh. Number one is the Bay Harbor Butcher. I think it's pretty obvious why the Bay Harbor Butcher is number one on this list. Who could have guessed the twist that Sergeant Dokes was the Bay Harbor Butcher all along? Our favorite hard-boiled, foul-mouthed detective was secretly a serial killer all along? Who could have guessed? Surprise, motherfucker! A bloody gotcha. Or I didn't. And you're like, that's a bad joke. So, so close to the end of the video and you 
you're rolling out bad jokes like that. So obviously, number one on this list is Dexter Morgan, the Bay Harbor Butcher. I mean, how can he not be? Michael C. Hall carries the entire show on his shoulders. His performance is spectacular. It's so amazing. Dexter, the donut guy. The guy who's a serial killer with no emotions. He's like, oh, I work at a cop station. Uh, cops, what are they like? They're like donuts. I'll be the donut guy. And he brings donuts to everybody. His face smile, his whole demeanor, even dating Rita at first. It's all this facade to hide who he truly is. And it's such a fascinating, incredible character. In a world where there's nothing but anti-heroes, Dexter is such a fascinating and different anti-hero. He's not an anti-hero with a heart of gold or, you know, pushed into this circumstance due to life and his family or something like that. He's just a psychopath, like a flat out psychopath. But he's a killer that kills the killers. And it's such a crazy, fascinating character. And it's such an interesting moral dilemma and moral question it kind of poses the audience. Like, how much of what he's doing is justified? How much will you accept? Because he kills, like, everyone on this list is killing absolute horrific monsters, like the Minotaur Man. Dexter is a fascinating and amazing character, but it's completely and utterly brought to life through Michael C. Hall's performance. He kills it. He is so good. Even when the writing isn't great, he is fantastic. And he kind of takes us through this world, through the lens of this serial killer, through this narration, this suave, charismatic, often very darkly funny narration. The amount of humour they wring out of these dark word puns go from very, very clever to completely on the nose. But they're always hilarious, and they really trick us the way he's tricking all the other characters in this world about this fake Dexter facade, and it's absolutely incredible. It's so fascinating and scary. Dexter is an iconic character, from his kill costume to his kill room, plastic wrap, kill tools, even his blood slides, his Hawaiian shirts, just the whole look of him is so awesome. Now, before my mouth falls completely down his dick, I've do gotta say, like, there are some things that I find a little annoying, but that's mostly down to the writing. Like, Michael's Hill, performance, amazing. But it's really frustrating that they find it so hard to punish Dexter or to force Dexter to go outside his code. They do it every now and then, but I would really like to have Dexter forced to kill to survive. Kill someone that he loves, he claims to love, but they never really do that. Anytime someone gets close, it's always someone else. Like, look, Werner finds out, Deb kills her. And it's always kind of doing that, where it's like, I don't know, I feel like the plot armor making Dexter this hero that we love, and never he never goes outside the code, and all that kind of stuff, it's a little frustrating, and it's I feel like it's almost acceptable for the whole show, up until season eight, where I was really expecting the last couple of episodes to really shock and wow us with how far Dexter was going to go. But they kind of went the opposite way. And no, actually, he's in love with Hannah. He doesn't have the Dark Passenger. And he's just going to sail into a hurricane and be a lumberjack or whatever. So it's like, okay, okay, not good enough. But that being said, even with all the sailing into the hurricane, the lumberjack stuff, the leaving Harrison with Hannah... All the stuff that I absolutely loathe, the fact that he's never punished, there's no hunt for the Bay Harbor Butcher Part 2, all of these things, honestly, when re-watching, I just forgive, I always forgive all of it, because I just love watching Michael C. Hall in this role, as this character. There's something so amazing. I love how hot and sweaty everyone is in Miami. Everyone's all like, that's a hot and sweaty Dexter, and Dexter's like, it is. <laughs> I love seeing him being the blood spatter analyst, analyzing a crime scene or CSI style but he's like the blood means this and this and this it's such a interesting fun different take on the you know CSI kind of crime thing and we're seeing it through the lens of this blood this psycho blood guy he just loves blood and he can read a crime scene in a certain way all of those scenes are always so much fun there's so much to love about the character it's just such an incredible idea the moral dilemma this show poses us is so scary and terrifying because he doesn't have any remorse you know he's not an anti-hero doing it because of this or this or that he's a serial killer he's a psycho he just needs to murder and it's the most despicable kind of like type of like like monster like he's awful but because of the code and the way the show is structured to be on his side we're constantly asking like no i'm okay with dexter am i and that is just so fascinating as we go further and further into the series it's so fascinating to see that play out and i think towards the end of the series it kind of loses sight a bit of that but it was really just doing something that i wasn't on board with fully because at the end of the day he's killing people that deserve to die but only because he was told to do it like that like he still needs to kill and i think the most fascinating and amazing line that kind of sums up the entire series is where lundy says the only reason to kill is to save an innocent life and then dexter says in his narration i didn't do it to save innocent lives but save them i did 
Oh, 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 oh boy. Oh, there's a lot going on with this character and I've bloody love it. It's uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's such an amazing and terrifying concept and it's just, it's brought to life so well for almost all of the series. I really liked so much of his character. I think I just really wanted to hunt for the Bay Harbor Witcher part two. I wanted to see all of these characters, Angel Masuka, Deb when she's alive and she's chosen to be on Dexter's side and she's like, oh no, everyone knows now. And then no, I'm, I'm cool with it. Oh no. I just want, like, I don't want Angel to find out because that would be heartbreaking for Angel. But that's what the show kind of posed at the very start. It's like, this is a serial killer, he's getting away with it, and he's he's hiding from everyone, and he's a, a bloody cop. He's a bloody forensic splat it, blood spatter guy. I just want everyone to find out. I want them, and there's so much of the show where they're like, you know, like now Do everyone thinks it's Dokes, but it's not Dokes, it's him. I want everyone to realize that, oh no, LaGuardia was right, Dokes was right, this was right, blah, 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 blah. I just, there's so much material to kind of wring out of this juicy and horrifying and terrifying concept that we never got with season eight. Dexter is compelling, funny, terrifying, an amazing character. I so miss Dexter having fellow killers on his table and he has a soulful d &M with them and then he kills them and he's like, I'm done with that therapy session, on to the next one. It's just such an amazing character, such an amazing concept. And I just love everything about it. And Michael C. Hall just, ah, oh, Thanks for watching guys, like, subscribe, all the YouTube things, and comment below with your rankings list. I'd love to hear what the general consensus is 10 years later of all the serial killers. Is everyone's list really similar? Are they really different? Are there characters I missed that you would have put on or vice versa? I just love to know. So yeah, comment and yeah, gatches!